Okay, birthdays and anniversaries. Birthdays. Dr. D. Lisa. Yeah, I'm glad you people are standing up so I don't have to be called out. Yeah. Anyone else? Any more birthdays? How about anniversaries? All right, well, let's sing. Let's stand and sing happy birthday. Come on, ready. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. You may be seated, Dr. D. Let's go back and get a red book, turn page 284. 284. Stand up. Might as well. Yes. Stand, stand to your feet. We're going to sing Come Morning. Stay strong or stand up. You sing strong? <clears throat> yeah. Whatever Steve said. Yeah. <laughs> God's children too long have been burdened. They are longing for heaven's green shore, where heartaches are left far behind us, and burdens are carried no more. Come morning, I'll walk by the river. I'll rest So I'll carry my cross through the midnight. Come morning, there's glory for me. Sometimes I'm despised and rejected, and I question, oh Father, how long? Then take one more look at Mount Calvary, and it gives me the strength to go on. Come morning, I walk by the river. I'll rest neath the evergreen tree. So I'll carry my cross through the midnight. Come morning, there's glory for me. If our ushers come forward, we'll take up the morning offering. Ask Brother Gary to lead us to the Lord in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come this morning, thank you just for putting you back in your house once again. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings you've already put over for us this day. 
this morning in the service. But I thought you'd be able to thank your feet stand and get them to worship peace and have us to hear this day. Help us, Lord, to faithfully preach the word of life by as they walk through life. We come this morning, Lord, praying for our nation, praying for our leaders. Ask, Lord, that they come to realize they need to be looking to you for guidance and direction. Lord, we ask you to bless the people in this church. Ask that we see a great coming back into your house and worship in you. We ask, Father, that you send us out to those that are lost, whatever they might be. Not be able to get them in, but here to preach the word to Jesus Christ. So I ask, Father, that you bless all of our sick and afflicted, that you touch them with that mighty healing hand, Lord. Lord, we want to see you come for them once again. Thank you for being this, deal with each request this morning, Lord, as only you can. Thank you, bless this offering, but if we have to give, we'll reach out and not. Thank you for the little thing. Lord, we lift those down to the hands of faith, Lord. Help us in whatever we do and whatever we say. We bring honor and glory unto you. Forgive us our little sins. We pray, God, through Jesus Christ, this name. So again, don't forget homecoming next Sunday. We'll start at 10.30, 10.30, 10.30. No Sunday school. Be here at 10.30. Uh, Cook plenty. Just get ready to have a good time. Steve's going to sing for us today. Thank you, Steve, for volunteering. Last... uh, in the last little bit, we've had a in-law member, family member pass away. Family taking it hard, but uh, she was known by all of them. I sent her saved by grace. Therefore, she's a winner in passing away. So uh, that's my oldest son's mother-in-law. And they all knew her as Mama Marie because she was a mama to all of them, grandchildren and all. <clears throat> and, oh, I'm sorry, Eric, number 19. Uh, she knows that she was a winner. She knew she was a winner. Either way it went. She'd been holding to God's hand a long, long time. And as I knelt beside her bed, my heart was thrilled at what she said. If I go or if I stay, the victory's mine. If I go or if I stay, For I still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have my healing here below or life forever if I go. Praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. None of us really knows 
about tomorrow. We must prepare to go to heaven any day. But while we're here, let's trust the Lord. He'll lead us safe to our reward. And by His grace, we'll be a winner either way. I'm a winner either way. If I go or if I stay, for I still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have my healing here below, or life forever if I go. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. I'm a winner either way, if I go or if I stay, for I'll still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have my healing here below, our life forever if I go. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. God bless you. Take your Bible and turn this morning to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. As you're turning there, not too long ago, just within the past several weeks, we had the opportunity to do a study in the book of Revelation. Those of you that attended on Wednesday nights, we talked about uh, the foretelling of what was to happen. We talked about the sincerity of how soon that could be and, and how that we should be urgent in reaching others and in reaching out to the lost. And we talked about literally today could be the first day of the tribulation, meaning Jesus could come back before this hour even ends, and that would begin from this moment forward, the tribulation, and, and obviously those things which play out in the book of Revelation. As I thought about that, there's a couple of other things that, that we need to understand as a church. And, and it troubles me that, that we don't look at this and take seriously what God has told us in Scripture when it comes to the assembling of ourselves together. You see, would you believe that this morning we're going to read a passage of Scripture that literally tells us that as the time draws near, as Jesus Christ's return draws and approaches, the Bible tells us that we should be absolutely fervent in our assembling together one with another. We're going to read about that this morning, but there's a couple of reasons why. We're going to expound on those, on why it is that we would come and, and, and fellowship together. Now, you may be sitting there saying to yourself, well, Tim, of course a preacher is going to say that you ought to come and, and fellowship together. A preacher doesn't want to preach to just empty pews, and, and no doubt there's a little bit of that, I'm sure, that played a part in, in my thinking, but there's so much more than just the preaching when it comes to the assembling of ourselves together. I, I believe with all of my heart when God's Word is preached, when we open God's Word and read it, I believe, as the Bible teaches us, that the Word that's cast out doesn't come back void. I believe that it benefits us to read God's Scripture, to have preaching about God's Scripture, to have expository preaching about what God has to say, and, and I hope to never, ever neglect that. But folks, this morning, I want you to look around, and I want you to find one person in the crowd. Just look around and find one person in the crowd, all right? Now, I want you to think of how great it is to be in worship with that one person. If it was just you and that person, and you began the conversation, and it was the conversation that went something like this, aren't you glad that God is so good? And that's how the conversation begins. Could you, with that individual, with that person, could you begin to start talking about truly how God is so good in your life? 
No doubt you probably could. How is it that you have that relationship with that person? Well, some of you, you look at family members. And obviously, our heart's desire and goal is that that might uh, help develop our relationship, that God might be the center of that relationship, be it a child, be it a parent, be it a cousin, be it a brother, be it a brother-in-law, be it a nephew, be it a sister-in-law, be it a sister. You name whatever relationship you got, you hope that God's the center of that and, and that relationship would be developed. Others looked around the room and saw maybe a friend down front or a friend to the side, and, and you began to talk or think to yourself about you know how that that person, no doubt, would be somebody that you feel comfortable with, and therefore you could share your faith, you could share what God's doing. But I dare say not a single person looked around in the room and said, you know, I probably couldn't talk to them about my faith. Not a single person in this room probably looked around and said, yeah, I'd feel a little uncomfortable talking about how God was so good to me this week, I wouldn't feel comfortable talking to that person. Now, that's not to say that you have everyday conversation with these folks. I, I would sit here and I, I, it would be a challenge for me to say that. I know that when I was just a teenager, me looking around and seeing a senior adult and talking about that, that would have been uncomfortable to have everyday conversation with them. But it wouldn't have been out of realm for me in that church to sit there and say, you know, I could tell them how great Jesus is to me. It would be very simple to do in a church, right? And so as a result, we have this place that we come together and we assemble together, and by its own nature, we have found it to be comfortable to speak about how great God is in our own lives, and we're able to share that with each other. We're able to build relationships with one another, and God's able to bless that, and we're able to grow. Now, I say that, but could you do that at a ball game? Could you do that at a school event? Could you do that even at a homecoming for your own house, meaning your own family reunion? Could you do that uh, in, the, in the Walmart or in the Kmart or in the Kroger or in the uh, Food City or wherever it is you may be? Could you do it at the Cracker Barrel? You know, there's a lot of folks that, that we come in contact with on a regular basis that, to be honest with you, it may be a little uncomfortable at times to really talk about our faith, right? There, there just may be an environment where you don't feel good about doing that. But in church, man, you talk about being able to let it fly. Man, you can let it fly here at church, and everybody's going to agree. Yep, God's been good to me, and we're all going to have those stories. What would happen if you found yourself in a life for you had no place to share that which God has done in your life, that is good. Where would you be in your walk with God? Where would you be if you were going through life and you had no place where you could sit there and share with someone else of a like faith about Jesus Christ and what he has done for you? Man, it'd be pretty easy to eventually get out of having that close walk and that close relationship with God, wouldn't it? Because you have nobody there to challenge you. You have nobody there to share. You have no reflection on what God has done on your own to, to share with other people. And so, therefore, it almost would become complacent. It would almost become a time where you would just, just ignore sharing what God has done in your life. And here's my fear. My fear is, based on just the events of the past couple of years, our churches have gotten to the point where it's easier to not talk about God, it's easier not to come to church, it's easier not to exercise my faith, and yet here's the problem. We're drawing closer and closer and closer and closer to the time of Christ's return. Man, that's contradictory to what God says. Look with me, if you will, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin reading with verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Would you stand with me as we read together? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says this, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Brother Johnny, would you lead us in prayer? Amen. And you may be seated. I want to give you a phrase. I want you to hear this phrase. I want you to sort of repeat this phrase in your mind. And I don't want you to ever forget this phrase when it comes to, to meeting and gathering as a church. I want you to look at verse 25. And I want you to remember this phrase that comes close to the end. It says, and so much the more. And so much the more. Repeat it with me if you would. And so much the more. What does that mean? And so much the more. What does that mean? Well, it means even more so. It means uh, at a maximum, if you would, even more so. Don't forget, even more than just meeting together, even more than just exhorting each other together. Don't forget the reason why you're meeting. Even more so than the assembling of yourselves together. Even more so than, than the exhorting of each other. Don't forget that Jesus Christ is coming. As he draws nigh, as it becomes nearer and nearer, much more we should be drawing closer and closer, assembling ourselves together, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, all much the more as we get closer and closer to Christ's return. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. I, I don't expect answers publicly, but I want you to think about this. Do you feel that our, uh, our society as a whole, do you feel, even as our church as a whole, do you believe that as we get closer and closer to Christ, so much the more we have chosen to gather together? Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. As we've gotten closer and closer to the return of Christ. Let's say that Jesus is coming this afternoon at 6 o'clock. Can we honestly say that over the past, let's use three or four years, can we honestly say that we have so much the more decided to meet together? That we have so much the more decided that we would come together and exhort one another? Have we chosen to do that? You see... Unfortunately, as we look around, we know the true answer to that. We know that we haven't. In fact, this morning, as you got up, I have no doubt that the devil beat you up saying every good reason why it is that you shouldn't be here this morning. I have no doubt in that. And boy, you talk about the devil working overtime. If God is telling us so much the more that we ought to be here, I assure you the devil is working overtime that so much the more he's going to work to make sure you don't get here. This week, in particular this morning, I have no doubt that the devil really attacked you and tried his best to get you from gathering together, to get you to not come, to get you to not be a part of this service, to get you to stay at home and do whatever or to go somewhere and do something else. And I have no doubt in my mind, as God has told us so much the more we should gather, the devil has worked so much the more to keep us from meeting. Now, folks... I'm going to tell you something. There's victory in that. You say, what are you talking about, Tim? Look around. People are missing this morning. How is there victory in that? I know. I know without a doubt that if the devil is putting his energies and his effort into keeping his people from meeting, he knows that if they meet, God will move. And you know why you're here this morning? You may think it's because you've got something going on or maybe you made a commitment or maybe you made a promise or maybe you decided that you needed to go somewhere afterwards and it was just easier to be here than it was to be at home. A lot of different reasons on, in your mind may be coming to, uh, coming to mind as to why you're here, but I'm going to tell you why you're here. God put it in your heart to be here. You say, Tim, no man, really? I was, I was planning to go after church out to eat and... 
You know, I, I plan to meet a couple of my buddies at church, and we're going to leave from church to go out to eat. And I'm going to tell you that that was what was going on in your mind. But I assure you what's going on in your spirit is God urging you to come to this place. And that's the Holy Spirit moving in your life, and you don't even know it. You see, God's purpose for you being here this morning was so that you might hear this message, that it might move you to do something that, that you weren't even planning to do, that it might trigger something in your mind, that you hear something that you wouldn't have heard this week, that God has specially prepared for you, that lo and behold, in all my frailty and all my lack of, of ability, for whatever reason, God chose me to say something that you needed to hear, and now all of a sudden you're able to take it and use it, and God's able to bless you because of it. This morning, you're not here by mistake. I sometimes get so frustrated when I hear people say, well, yeah, I, I went to church and, and, you know, I just happened to accidentally be there and then God did something. No, let me tell you something. God knew that was going to happen from the very beginning. Don't ever think, don't ever in your mind believe that God is ever surprised by anything. He wasn't surprised when his son went to Calvary, and he's sure not surprised with my faults and flaws, and he's sure not surprised by my willing to come and rededicate my life. God is not surprised. But you know what it takes from us? It takes from us a willingness to obey. You see, Johnny, God had in store all along today for you to hear something. God had for, for you and you alone something that was special. And God says, I'm going to give it to Johnny. And the rest of the church gets to hear it. It may touch other people's lives. It may be important to them as well. But Johnny, this is specific to you. God is not sitting there saying, oh yeah, it's just a cart walk. Here you go. God has a special message for you. Now, I can pick on Johnny and say that, and y'all are going, yeah, you preach to Johnny. Johnny needs it. And, and uh, no doubt, uh, you know, there's somebody here this morning, probably David back here, that says, man, you need to get on Johnny. Johnny, I'm telling you, Johnny needs it if anybody needs it. Johnny even asked if he could sing during homecoming. Oh, boy, God really has got to work on Johnny now. But it's not just Johnny. You see, Johnny's my friend. I can pick on him a little bit, and he's not going to get upset with it. But I'm going to tell you, I could have picked out any person in this room and told you the very same thing. God has a message that's designed just for you. We read scripture about the sparrow and about the lily of the field. And one of the great things about that is, is if God had enough fault for those, you better know God has enough fault for the people that he gave his own son for that you might have eternal life. God says, by the shedding of his blood, and we just read it just a moment ago, by the shedding of his blood with his flesh, the veil was torn from top to bottom. You're now no longer held on the outside of the Holy of Holies. You are invited in. There is a royal priesthood of the church, and you're a part of that if you know Jesus, and you're able to enter in. You've been sprinkled with the blood of Christ. You've been covered with the, uh, with the blood of Christ. You've been washed with the, with the blood of Christ. And now you can walk into the Holy of Holies with the greatest of confidence, knowing that God has a place for you to come and meet with Him. And it's called the church. You say, well, Tim, I can meet with God anywhere. And yes, absolutely you can. Aren't you thankful that, that God will meet you anywhere? Aren't you thankful today that God's in the bar as much as He is right here in the church house? Aren't you thankful that God is in the places that you would think would be the worst of places in that back alley with the drug addict as he is right here in God's house with the greatest of Christians? God is there for every person in every place and God is able to meet the needs of every person right where he's at. And I'm thankful for that. But let me tell you something, folks. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's not a reason for you to be in the back alley with a needle in your arm trying to meet God. God's already given you all that you need to meet with him here in his house. And when you forsake the assembling of yourselves to be here today, when you forsake that opportunity to be in God's house around other Christians, you are forsaking the opportunity to come together, to get replenished, to get encouraged, to get excited about serving God, to maybe share something that's an encouragement to someone else. When we forsake the assembling of ourselves together, we allow the devil to have a little victory in our lives. And that is unfortunate, and it is unfortunate not only for us, but for the folks around us. I believe with all of my heart when God's people obey God 
and we do the things that God tells us to do, great things are in store for us. One of the reasons why I enjoy coming to church, one of the reasons why I love getting up in the morning on a Sunday morning and, and driving down to church is because I know that every single time I meet in God's house with other Christians, I know that my voice goes up to heaven and God hears it and God joins us and gathers with us where two or more are gathered together in my name, there's where I'm going to be, right? And we know that, and man, I get excited about that. I get encouraged by that. I, I, I just sometimes think to myself, God, what are you going to unfold upon your people today? But I'm also going to tell you there's some days I sit there and I realize, man, the devil sure does like to beat me up on Sunday morning. Man, the devil sure does like to put obstacles in my way to get to God's house. Man, God sure does love to stop His people from coming to this place and worshiping God openly and freely as we can right now. I made the comment about a year and a half ago, maybe a year ago, I made the comment and I stick by it even today. You talk about a trial run for the devil. The devil had a trial run on how to shut down the church with COVID. And he succeeded. He succeeded on knowing exactly what he could do to allow a government to step in and tell a church that they have to close down. Now, I'm going to be the first to tell you, I understood the seriousness of COVID. I understood our responsibilities as a part of the community when it dealt with COVID. We took uh, the steps that, that led us to do the things that we did because of that responsibility. And I, I, I look back and I think, you know, are there regrets? Yes. Are there disappointments? Yes. But do I believe in my heart that the decisions were made were the right decisions at the time? Yes, I do. And I'm going to tell you why. I believe that we acted responsibly as based on what we knew responsibilities were. But here's the problem. That decision was made at this church by its leadership for the benefit of its people. What I don't agree with is a mandate from a government telling a church that they are to shut down. And I will never, ever agree with that. And you say, Tim, you're getting political. No, it has nothing to do with politics. I want you to hear this and hear this clearly. When you have a heart that's open to God, the church has no place, or excuse me, the, the, the world has no place, and your government has no place to tell you how to do that worship. Now, if this church would have chosen to come together to meet and to gather, we would have done so, but we would have done so with the guidance of God, not with the issuance of, a, of an edict from a government. I say that because there were certain places in this country that did demand churches shut down. And they did it under the false pretense that it's for the good of all, but yet Walmart was wide open. It was for the good of all that schools were still going on. It was for the good of all that, lo and behold, if it meant making money, that's a different ball game. And it troubles me that our churches were so quick to surrender that right. And you say, Tim, are you trying to move now from the assembling of ourselves together to now this idea of our constitutional rights and things of that nature? Not entirely, no, but there is a part in that. Folks, I say that because when we choose to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, we open the doors for a, a, a government to come in and say, you can no longer worship, you can no longer meet, you can no longer gather, and when that happens, then how will you have the opportunity to meet except underground? Today, we can do it openly. And do you know what our response is? I might go and I might not. So if it's that response now why it's open, what do you think your response is going to be if all of a sudden the government says shut down? You're not going to care. You're not going to be active in an underground church. You're just going to say, oh, whatever. As a result, what's going to happen to our faith? As we read the book of Revelation, I saw these things playing out just based on what has happened in the world today. Forget about all that's going to happen in the, in the time of tribulation. Just as of today, how easy it would be to shut down the churches in America. 
Folks, there's already countries in this world that are shut down now to the churches, and it has to be underground. And thankful to God, there are people that have a passion for Jesus and a passion for the church that they gather with the, op uh, with the understanding that it could mean their life. And we won't even get up on a Sunday morning to come to an open worship service to give God praise and thanks for how free we really are. Now, I say all that, and I'm sure you're sitting here saying, man, Tim, you're stepping on my toes. You're throwing stuff at me. Man, you're getting bitter, and you're getting ugly, and you're getting all evil, and I just don't like none of it. I'm going to let you know. Here's the good part of it. I'm going to change gears for a moment. You heard the fussing. You heard me sort of share why it's important to me, but you've also heard the fussing that we're not doing what God wants us to do. We're not being faithful in how that we ought to be doing it. Here's the best part about being a Christian. God says when the truth is presented and you hear it, what you do is you don't run from it, you confess to it, you come back to God and you ask God for forgiveness. And the Bible says not only does God restore you, God heals you and he puts you right back in the game. Now you knew I couldn't go the whole entire service without throwing a football analogy at you after Alabama lost a football game last, yesterday, right? I want to throw something at you. This quarterback for Texas A&M comes in, he gets the football, he makes a throw, touchdown, man, it's awesome, everybody's screaming and yelling. And lo and behold, that quarterback has somebody roll across his leg and he goes down, and I, I looked over at Dara, and I said, Dara, he's probably done. They literally help him off the field. And he goes limping off, they're carrying him off, and he goes back under that little tent, and I said, I'll be shocked if he doesn't come out and he's not wearing a boot and he's got a broken ankle. I'll be shocked. Well, he came back out. Not only did he come back out, there wasn't a boot. Not only did he take that field again, but he walked back out there and threw the, uh, the winning pass ultimately. He threw a pass that got him right down to, uh, to I think it was the 20, 25 yard line. Or the guy kicks the field goal and Alabama loses the game and everybody's just like, what just happened, right? This guy went under the tent and I was convinced his night was done. Only to come back out and have the opportunity to make a play that brought them right back down the field that gave them the chance to ultimately kick the field goal and beat Alabama. Now, I want you to know something. Those people talked about him all night long. This morning I got up, they were still talking about this quarterback from Texas a &M. By the way, he was a backup. He wasn't a starter at the beginning of the year. That guy got hurt. He had to come into the game. So that guy has been talked about all night long, got talked about all morning this morning, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, I'm even preaching a sermon this morning about this one guy. But here's the illustration I want you to know. Sometimes we are just like that quarterback where all of a sudden somebody rolls up on our leg and all of a sudden we are convinced that's the last play that I'll ever make for God. That's the last thing God's ever going to let me do. My faith isn't where it ought to be. My heart's not where it ought to be. My walk with Christ is not where it ought to be. There's no way as I look back, that's the last thing that God's going to ever have me do. And that's the way we enter into life. And all of a sudden, we hear the truth and the truth is presented. And you're able to hear what God has said to each one of us. And something clicks. God, I hear you. God, I know the answer. God, you put it in my heart. God, you uh, told me long ago when I studied that when you said if I'm faithful and just to con confess my sins to you, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me unto righteousness. And so at that moment, you come and you say, God, I open my heart to you. God, I confess my sins to you. God, I want to get back in the game. God, I am sorry. I confess my sins to you. I ask for your forgiveness. And as a Christian, God does exactly what he says that he's going to do for you. He forgives you of your sins and makes you whole. And then God does the greatest thing for the Christian next to his salvation is this. Go and pick on Johnny again. Hey, Johnny, you've asked for forgiveness. I know you're repenting of your sins and I know that you're back in the game. I know that you're, you're longing to do what I want you to do. So, Johnny, here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to go right back in and I want you to keep doing what I ask you to do because I've got a special plan just for you. And so Johnny goes back in the game. And Johnny may not even realize it, but God has somebody already waiting on him if he'll just repent and turn back to him. Already waiting for when Johnny confesses his sin, for when Johnny says, God, I'm sorry, for when God, sa uh, God says to Johnny, Johnny, you're forgiven of your sins and you're made whole. Johnny, there's somebody special waiting for you to go and reach and to share your testimony or to go and reach and share God's word. And they're waiting on you. But you know what? They're, and God's waiting on us to make that first response of, God, I confess my sins to you. Would you forgive me? And the minute we do, God is back in action giving us our plan of what we should be doing with our lives if we'll be obedient. Now, I say that to say this this morning. Remember when I said I was going to give you that word of encouragement? This morning, if you're here, and you know that your walk with Christ isn't where it ought to be, or you know that there's things in your mind that are taking you away from doing the will of God, if you know in your own heart that, that there are things that are stumbling blocks along your path and you need to open it up to God, I want you to know this morning, if you're willing today, if you're willing this morning to come and, and literally get before God and say, God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins this morning. God, I want to repent, my, uh, repent of those sins and I want to uh, turn back to you and I want to open my life back up to you. God, whatever it is, you lead me and I will follow. I'll be obey. I want you to know God has something waiting for you to do as you get back up and as you head back out. God has a plan for you that's only waiting on the other side of these walls. But we first must act in obedience to him. Oh, I pray that you will. Lost person, I pray that as you've gathered this morning that you understand with all your heart. We have a loving God who's given you this opportunity in this place. You've gathered this morning not even knowing why it is you're here. And yet God has something just for you today. It's his son. It's his gift of salvation. And it's forgiveness of sin if you'll just come. Oh, I pray that you will. Will you stand with me with heads bowed and with eyes closed this morning? And as Brother David makes his way back, as he gets ready to sing a song and a hymn of invitation this morning, I just want to ask you, with heads bowed and with eyes closed, has God spoken to you today? Has God laid something on your heart today? Maybe it's not necessarily that you need to do something, but you know that there are others around you that need to make some decisions and you know that God's put it on your heart to share that with those folks. Maybe this morning God's telling you what you need to do is when you get home today, pick up the phone and call and tell others how you missed them today and how you long for them to be back in the gathering of our church that they might be able to worship Him with you. Oh, I pray that whatever God lays on your heart that that not only would you bathe it in prayer, but that you'd be obedient to his calling, that we might be submissive to him this morning, not to our will, but to his. Oh, I pray that you'll come. Father, I pray that you might have your way during this time of invitation. God, that when it's all said and done this morning, that everything that we do might be pleasing to you. And Father, that as we go forward uh, out into the world, that God, you might already have those opportunities before us ready to go and that we might be faithful to do the things which you place upon our hearts. For it's in your name we pray. And with heads bowed and with eyes closed, as God spoke to you this morning, and as Brother David sings, would you come? Brother David sings another verse. Oh, how I pray that you might be obedient to him. Oh, if you know this next verse, you sing with him. But here's the thing. If you're going to sing just as I am, you've got to mean just as I am. As Brother David is singing this song, 
literally what we are being told in this song is this. I don't have to get better to come to God. God takes me just as I am. I need to come now just as I am. If God's spoken to you this morning, oh, would you come? If you know this verse, would you sing it with him as he leads, Brother David? I'm so glad you're here this morning. I hope and pray you'll join with us this Wednesday night in our Bible study. Don't forget, go home, make plenty of phone calls, reach out to your friends, loved ones, those who maybe are members who haven't been here for a while. Remind them and let them know. Next Sunday is our homecoming. We want them to be here, to be a part of that. Don't forget to make plenty of food. David, do you want to share anything about our special guests next week? And certainly we're excited about having them with us next Sunday. Brother Eric, starting at 1030, don't forget, 1030 next Sunday. There won't be Sunday school. Our service starts at 1030. Uh, and so you'll want to come and be a part of that as, as we have a great time just worshiping and celebrating in the Lord. Anyone else? Monday at 6, our women's Bible study. Thank you. Any others? If not, Brother Tony, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer today?